Thank you for joining us for this special talk event between Nishto Steyer and Trevor Paglem, who are two of the artists featured in Universal Remote. My name is Yoon Jihe, and I am a special researcher at the National Arts Center, and I devised and curated this exhibition. Today's discussion is a continuation of the talk that the two had at the Pompidou in 2018, which is included in, this cat in the catalogue of this exhibition. I'd just like to summarise that. In 2018, the two had a discussion about images, AI, surveillance technology, facial recognition, are a few examples of what AI had achieved by that point. Also, AI technology and how images are impacted from very close to hand examples such as smartphones as part of the discussion. And I'd just like to summarize some of the key points from that discussion. In 2018, Trevor Paglum was talking about the emergence of the invisible images. Images by definition, are visible to the eye. However, AI has now hidden images from human view and human sight. And with surveillance cameras and facial recognition, as a few examples going beyond that, as we live in contemporary society, we are always being seen by various machines. And the Universal Remote features a book features work by Trevor, which is utilizing AI, and this was uh, created in 2017, the year before the Pompidou talk. And looking at that, you can see the world which is seen by AI through the learning process where the AIs teach each other. AIs suction off and draw up vast quantities of information from human beings, and they consume vast quantities of images and also information. But um, this, which goes far beyond anything achievable by any single individual, is also politicized and becomes political. The basis of AI technology is physical infrastructure, and there, of course, you also have a political thought and also objectors. The emergence of the invisible images made possible by AI, the implications for global power, techno uh, power, global political power, and also global capitalism is what was touched upon by Trevor. With Dutch Dial, it was about artificial intelligence, or rather artificial stupidity, and how it surrounds us all. The danger of becoming too accustomed to that is what Dutch Dial was talking about. For example, looking at smartphones, We are going to be enslaved by standards of beauty which are at the same time discriminatory, for example, whitening or also clearing your complexion. And not just smartphones, it's also is part of what surrounds us on an everyday basis, which is almost magical in terms of how much it can permeate and also penetrate our awareness. Because of that, it is fundamentally destructive. Also, AI is not just promoting the consumption of images, it also consumes energy and also electrical power. It's also part of what Hito is talking about. Also, when you look at nation states and capitalism and what they also have in mind, and with the machine learning of AI and also the possibility that Things may language may become privatized or monopolized and also be appropriated or stolen. And so image and power are inseparable. It also promotes us and also drives us. And Hito is concerned about the development and also maturation of technology, including AI and the global tendency. And so with the far right and also authoritarian powers which may possibly be empowered by this is part of what the two were concerned about. And at the very end of that discussion, they said that they need to talk about this further. 
In 24, I think that the discussion is still important and also relevant. AI is now able to carry out conversations with human beings which sound natural, emotionally speaking. They also uh, have implications for de deciding or determining, rather, the future of elections and the outcome of wars. Now that there are fake um, news clips or uh, video footage and also the psyops which are going on and information wars. And so the situation has actually become even more fierce and even more frightening. Technology is astonishingly developed, but human beings have not changed and they have not learnt, is what comes to mind. The autonomy of images, or we all these images can kill, but now their fingers are on the triggers, was the title of the debate that they had, or discussion they had in Pompidou. But now the trigger... The tr and now the trigger has not been um, actually pressed upon, but six years now later, perhaps the trigger has been pressed down. And so after the pandemic, the situation is even more conf confusing, and we think it's going to be a very interesting discussion that we're going to be having. And so I now... like to have Shito speak about her recent work for about 15 minutes. And after that, Trevor will be speaking for about 15 minutes. And then there will be a 45-minute discussion and a 5-minute Q&A. And we will be ending at 3.30. I should also introduce the speakers. Stuttgart was born in Munich, Germany in 1966, lives and works in Berlin. She studied documentary film at the Japanese, Japan Institute of the Moving Image and the University of Television and Film Munich, is the holder of a PhD in philosophy from the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna in 2003. Key solo exhibitions include Stuttgart, the city of broken windows at Leipzig, and the Stuttgart, the sea of data at the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, Korea, Seoul. She's also participated in the Art Mito Group exhibition, Hello World, for the Post-Human Age, and also I should mention that Duty-Free Art has been translated and published in Japanese in 21. So the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Jihir, for the wonderful show and for the generous introduction and also for the invitation here. I very much appreciate it. Thank you also to Trevor, especially to borrowing your glasses to me. <laughs> so today we will exactly look the same and I will see the world with Trevor's eyes, I think. Um, yeah, I have to, I cannot put it up, otherwise I cannot. Oh, in. Um, so what I wanted to do is, can we maybe see, no, okay, that's the wrong one, that this is, so what I'm going to do is to start talking a little about the work you can see downstairs, uh, Balan Mission Accomplished Balancier, um, just to give you some context about it, and then I will do a brief maybe introduction of where I think we are at right now in relation to digital images, just as a brief introduction to uh, Trevor's and my discussion later. So this is basically a recording of another variation of the installation you see downstairs, which is called Mission Accomplished Balancier. Um, was made in 2019, right before the pandemic. It was the last work we could still make before the pandemic. And it's a collaborative work made in collaboration with two young artists called Gago Gagoshice and Milos Trakilovic. Milos is from Bosnia originally and Gago is from Georgia. And it's a, so it's a lecture, video lecture, let's call it, that deals with 
the topic of fashion uh, in relation to world history and digital technology. So, um, we took basically the example of fashion brand Balenciaga as one example to discuss the period after the coming down of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and today to see how basically not only fashion but also digital technology but also politics have changed until then. And Balenciaga is a very interesting example where you can see all of these topics somehow coming together. Um, why is this? Because Balenciaga actually is produces some kind of data fashion, right? It's a fashion which is heavily based on extracting data on Instagram from its users, its fans, its followers, other people who are interested in fashion, and sort of mashing them up into some kind of meme fashion. That's the one thing. But um, we were also trying to compare this with the overall political developments in Europe after the coming down of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, because in the region of the Eastern Europe, a similar kind of extraction was taking place in the, in the guise of so-called privatization. Whatever was owned by the state before or by, you know, companies before was sort of transferred to private investors, in many cases Western investors, who were basically extracting this kind of resources um, from the area. So we are trying to link this era of privatization in Eastern Europe to the fashion-making um, procedure of Balenciaga. And what happened in Eastern Europe was that this type of privatization created a new political elite, very often also criminal elite, uh, but also oligarch elite, which very much likes fashion, you know, <laughs> not only Balenciaga, but also all other kinds of luxury brands are very much appreciated by this new elite. And uh, specifically, Balenciaga has taken a lot of inspiration from famous historical photos from that period. There is, for example, one, one example from the uh, period of the Sarajevo siege, um, where a woman during the Yugoslav war, Sarajevo was being besieged by Serbian forces. And there was one famous news photograph in which a woman walked down a street um, which was um, um, targeted by snipers. This is the photo, very um, famous news photo from that period. And she seemed completely unconcerned and was wearing a dress as if she was on a catwalk. And this um, specific dress reappeared later in a Balenciaga collection um, on, on, the, on the catwalk. So basically this kind of inspiration from world history and from fashion sources, here you see the basically copy-paste version that in which a historical situation which was experienced under extreme duress is sort of, um, well, it's commodified, it's turned into some sort of style, into a slightly edgy style, etc., etc. The same thing happened, of course, with um, workers' uniforms. DHL uniform is a very um, well-known example. IKEA bags, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, inspired fashion, and so on and so on. So basically, one of the propositions, which especially my colleague um, Gago Gagoshitze, who is also from Georgia, the main designer of Balenciaga, is from Georgia as well, describes as the commodification of the experience of the transition in which most of the people became actually very poor. 
So basically also this aesthetics of wearing second-hand clothes which do not fit properly, which are passed down, you know, from one brother to the sister to the brother, etc., etc. So that kind of aesthetic is being appropriated, extracted, and turned into a very um, expensive fashion product. So basically, the um, work is about describing this type of double extraction method. On the one hand, economical, on the ground in Eastern Europe, extracting resources, actual wells, but then also styles, looks, ways to lifestyles, etc. And then extraction of data from social media, uh, memes, etc., to sort of make the brand. That's basically what the work is about. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't think a lot has changed there, even though maybe yes. When I just, I just returned from Shanghai and I had the feeling this luxury brand thing is not working that well anymore. So maybe there is a kind of change happening there slowly already, but I'm not really sure about it. Yeah, so that's about Balenciaga. But Balenciage, yeah, we called it Balenciage because uh, Miloš found a sort of um, copy product somewhere in Sarajevo in a shopping mall, which was very cheap and of course copy paste and it was called Balenciage. So we made Balenciage into our brand and yeah, Balenciage. Okay. Um, so maybe this also transitions quite nicely into the other part of the talk, which is more about what I'm writing about now. It's more about the state of images at this current point in time. And uh, it also starts basically from a point where all sorts of cultural products are made from previous cultural products. This is a still from a very recent advertisement clip by Apple, which had to be retracted. It was called Crush. Have you seen it? Yeah, of course. You have seen it for two days because then the company had to withdraw it because it was so controversial. You know that it shows basically all these tools, cultural tools being flattened by a hydraulic press into what turns out to be a very flat and thin uh, iPad. And the one, one of the suggestions is that, you know, the iPad is going to replace all these cultural tools. And of course, everyone thinks, yes, it's going to, why is it going to replace all these cultural tools? Is this even necessary? And it, there was a huge, let's say, dissatisfaction with this clip, but it raises a bigger question, which is what happens when basically all the data of all the previous products get flattened and crushed into one flat plane. And one of the consequences is that everything starts looking the same. And the, the Apple clip is actually the best example because it is already copy-pasted from a previous um, clip, which was made by LG uh, a while ago. And it also shows a hydraulic press which is flattening all sorts of cultural products. So the Apple clip is already an example of everything starting to look exactly the same. Um, there is a very Im influential uh, text by actually a brand strategist called Alex Morell who wrote a text which was called The Age of Average, and he compared 10,000 brand websites with one another, and he found out that basically key, um, key topics all look the same. So these, this is basically cities from these websites, and they kind of all look the same. That, that's not even AI, <laughs> that's pre-AI, or Ah, what is this? Ah, these are cars. It's different brands, but still all look the same. Uh, these are toothbrushes. 
all in front of a pink background for some reason. Um, cosmetic products. Uh, this is particularly uh, scary. This is the so-called Instagram phase in which basically people, or women in this case, all start looking the same because of plastic surgery, because of filters, etc., etc. They start looking like a sort of human average in a way, right? You cannot exactly tell what kind of skin color it is. It is as if you superimposed all the faces on the world onto one another, and then they start you know, finding this sort of median point or average point of humanity. And of course, they look the same because this is sort of safe, not controversial. It's completely average. No one will be of offended, uh, most probably. And as you can probably imagine, this um, effect is much accelerated by AI. So these are images generated with Midjourney on very simple prompts. And they show basically exactly the same effect. This is a white car <laughs> in, a, in a wind tunnel. Looks exactly the same like the real image. And of course, why is this? Because the AIs are already trained on all the average data, so they will create more average representations. Uh, this has been also called the age of aesthetic consolidation where basically everything converges on this sort of normal curve. You know, you have no more statistical outliers. Everything converges on this kind of mean, which is also why I've called this kind of image production um, mean images, because they deal with the average. The mean is the average. Of course, it also has other meanings. And um, so there is a lot of things that have to be in place for these data collections to come together. They don't simply arise out of the blue. The processes which I've described in relation to Balenciaga are already necessary. You have to collect a lot of data from social media. You have to extract them. You have to be able to control them, to accumulate them. You need to have the infrastructure, the servers, the electricity, um, etc., in order to be to command, you know, the amount of data which you need to produce this kind of perfect very boring average, which is kind of fascinating. And the human part or the human labor is kept as invisible as possible, as in this uh, very famous historical machine. It's called the chess Turk, the chess robot, which was made in the 18th century. And it has this little person inside. Um, where a human plays chess, but everyone thinks that it's a robot which knows how to play chess. Uh, that's a very famous example. And one of my recent pro projects is to look for this person here. And my idea was, since this is a chess Turk, this is probably a chess Kurd. And uh, it, so it was. I went to Kurdistan. Kurdistan is a region which stretches across four different countries, but this is a region in North Iraq. There's a lot of uh, refugee camps there since the Syrian war, where a lot of people have fled already since 2011, or they lived there since more than 10, yeah, more than 10 years. It's already a very long time. Uh, in these camps, and these populations have been discovered as ideal workers for AI applications. Why? Because people have to prepare the data uh, in order for the machines to be able to read them. They need to annotate the images, assign tags to them, and so on and so on. And the World Bank, for example, discovered people in the so-called MENA region as ideal micro-workers, also in Palestine, very much targeted um, because, yeah, of course, they were well-educated. Many of them went to university, but then ended up in this very unfortunate situation where they had to accept also very work which was not well-paid at all. Um,
Yeah. The very um, paradoxical thing is that these people are mostly doing annotation labor for self-driving cars. So they tell the car how to orient itself in the street scene. They annotate scenes from Berlin, a lot of you know American cities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the car can learn how to um, find its way. But of course, the people who live there, they have no mobility whatsoever. There's not even a bus or something like that. They cannot cross the border and so on. And the most absurd thing is that even the cars themselves, the self-driving cars like this one, Apparently, they need not one driver, but 1.5 drivers in the background because they get stuck a lot. So you think it's a self-driving car, which is a robot and which doesn't need a driver, but in the background there is up to 1.5 workers who are helping the car to orient itself. So basically, all this work of annotating the data, teaching the car to drive, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, creates a demand for more people to work on these cars, which is kind of absurd. Let me conclude very briefly. The most interesting aspect for me in generative AI at the moment is um, not is not even the working conditions, is not the images, it's not the average, etc. It is that the most prominent output were protests. Generative AI has been extremely successful in creating protests in different parts of the world, mainly of artists who oppose AI because they feel threatened by it. This is a um, uh, a photo from the so-called Writers Guild of America strike who were also striking against AI being implemented in script writing. The actors were also striking. They were opposing, you know, um, face, being face printed so they could be replaced by AI generated avatars. So basically, there has been a lot of labor organization, not only of artists, but also, for example, of data annotators around the world, content moderators, and so on, who are opposed to the social um, consequences of generative AI. And this is the most prominent um, outcome that generative AI has created until today, a lot of different strikes. Thank you. So, Hito, thank you very much. We started from this um, Valenciga. Uh, the installation that you have here, and then you talked about Instagram faces and micro workers. So these are all the uh, aspects that you're quite interested in the recent days. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. And then let's move on to uh, Trevor Paglin's presentation. Let me introduce him uh, briefly. Trevor was born in Maryland, United States in 1974. He currently lives and works in New York and Berlin. He holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and PhD in Geography from the University of California, Berkeley. Among his solo exhibitions are uh, Trevor Baglin, Hide the Heat Real Show, The Falls at New Berlin, Kunvenstein, Berlin, 2023, and also at the uh, Pace Gallery in New York. And uh, he has been participating in Don't Follow the Wind, a group exhibition that opened in 2015 in the exclusion zone surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station in Japan. And also, he was also awarded the Namjoon Pike Art Center Prize in 2018 in South Korea and MacArthur Fellowship USA in 2017. So now, Trevor, I want to hand it over to you to start with the presentation. So, uh, Mr. Paglin, please, over to you. So thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for organizing this exhibition. Thank you for including me, and thank you for bringing um, my, my good friend Hito and us uh, together today. Um, I thought 
I would start just by giving a little bit of a background to my work. Um, I'll discuss some of the work in the exhibition below, and I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to how I think about making art. Um, I see my job in a, in a very simple way, and I see my job as being, uh, as, as trying to learn how to see the world around us and to try to share that with other people. And this is a very simple thing for me to say, but in practice, this can be a very difficult thing to do. And it can be difficult to do because the world is hard to see. Um, many of the things that shape the world around us, that shape our societies, are hidden from us. And so I try to learn how to see those things. I've spent a lot of time trying to see the world of technology, and technology is such a part of our everyday lives, and yet much of what it is and how it works is invisible to us. And I try to see this world of technology from many different perspectives. And this effort to try to see this world of technology around us has taken me from the bottom of the ocean up into the heavens above our heads. This is an example of the kind of thing that I mean. This is a map that Edward Snowden provided to my friend Laura Poitras while we were working on a film called Citizen Four about Edward Snowden. And the map describes the physical structure of the internet, and it describes the methods that the American military uses to take over and surveil the internet in different ways. You see a lot of different dots on this map. One of the most important dots are these blue dots. And these are the places where all of the continents are connected to one another on the internet, the places where undersea cables connect them. So one for one of the projects that's shown here, I wanted to travel to all of these blue dots. I wanted to see what these locations look like. This is one of them. And this looks like a normal beach scene, but this is one of the most abstract images I have ever made. In the frame of the photograph, there are a huge number of undersea cables connecting the east coast of the United States to Europe and there's a huge military presence sitting on these cables. But none of this is visible in the photograph. This is another abstract photograph of a place in California where the United States is connected to Japan and Asia. In the photographs, I have two rules. One, the horizon must be in the center of the photograph. And the second rule is the collection of undersea cables must be in the frame of the image. And what this implied was that if I could dive into the water in the photograph, I might be able to see the thing that I was actually trying to make an image of. And so I started to do that. I learned how to scuba dive and learned how to explore the bottom of the sea, looking for these undersea cables that connect the uh, planet's continents to one another. And it turns out that this works. When you find different spots on the sea, you can, you can find places where these convergences of internet cables do indeed connect the continents together. This is a place underwater that uh, connects Japan and Asia to Hawaii um, and then continues on to the mainland United States. These are other such places, and this might be funny, but this is the internet. This is what the internet looks like. I've spent a lot of time not only looking at the oceans, but looking at the skies trying to learn how to see the machines 
that live among the stars above us. Machines that live in the stars above us, but that are looking down at us. And I've looked at the clouds, photographing unmanned drones that are creating new kinds of warfare. Now, I said at the beginning of the talk that I see my job as trying to learn how to see the world around us. And when we set out to see the world, this happens on at least two axes. One axis is just what's out there. But the other axis has to do with time. And it has to do with the time of our ancestors and our descendants. And I think about making art as being part of a conversation, a conversation that's been happening for thousands of years and that will hopefully continue for many thousands more. And when you're looking at the sky or you're looking at the ocean, you're looking at a landscape that other artists have been looking at for thousands of years. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to see what is different about that landscape in your time, and how is that different than what that landscape looked like to your ancestors, and how might it look different from your descendants? How do the monsters that live in our skies look different from those who presented themselves to our ancestors in the past? So I've spent a lot of time trying to see the landscapes that define the present. And when I say seeing, I don't just mean seeing with your eyes, but also thinking with materials, thinking about how different materials are literally made out of different histories and how those materials also have politics embedded within them. I did that, as, um, as you mentioned, for the Don't Follow the Wind project here in Japan with uh, Chimpom and Jason Waite and Kentaro Ikigami and many others. Um, I made a sculpture, and to make this sculpture, we traveled to the exclusion zone to collect irradiated glass from the disaster. And then I traveled to New Mexico, to the place where the first nuclear weapon was detonated. And when the first nuclear weapon was detonated in the desert, the explosion was hotter than the surface of the sun and it's turned the surface of the desert into glass. And I collected some of that glass and I fused it together with the broken glass from the disaster here and we installed the sculpture back in the exclusion zone. So I spent a lot of time trying to see landscapes, looking at these drones and cables and satellites and the machines that populate our planet. But we, we should also remember that those machines are looking at us. And that brings us to another one of my interests. For the past 20 years or so, we've been completely surrounded by sensing systems and imaging systems. We're at a moment in history where most of the images in the world are made by machines for other machines, with humans very rarely in that loop. And in my studio, I've been developing tools that show us, as humans, what machines are seeing when they look out at the world. I've been trying to answer a central question, which is, how do machines see? How do computers see the world? How do historical landscapes look through the eyes of computer vision systems and artificial intelligence systems? What kinds of mathematical abstractions do computers turn landscapes into? And what kinds of images do we use to teach computers how to see? The images that we use to teach computers how to see are called training images. 
And this is also something I've spent a lot of time looking at. Sometimes training images are quite normal. This is a slide from the most widely used of these data sets of training images, and it's called ImageNet. This is pretty normal. They have a category called Apple, and inside the data set, they have many thousands of pictures of apples. And you can use a data set like this to train a machine learning model and use it to recognize things like oranges and apples and bananas. But when we start looking more closely at training data, we often find that there are some strange and disturbing things going on. It's a little strange. This is even stranger. Debtor, a category for debtors. How are we supposed to see what somebody's bank account looks like by looking at a picture of their face? It gets worse, and even worse. Training sets are filled with all sorts of racist, misogynistic, and cruel images and categories, especially when it comes to pictures of people. And so I wanted to show some of these very disturbing ways that computers were being taught to understand people. And I took inspiration from a man uh, from, named Takeo Kanade. And Mr. Kanade was the first person to invent facial recognition systems. And he did this in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And although Mr. Kanade was a computer scientist, he debuted his first facial recognition system as an art project. He did this at the Osaka World Expo in 1970. And his project was called Computer Physiognomy. It was a system that would take your picture and it would tell you which celebrity you most looked like, either John F. Kennedy or Winston Churchill or Marilyn Monroe. I wanted to take this idea and update it into the 21st century to show where this technology had gone. And so I built an AI model based on the kinds of people included in contemporary training sets. It was a system that you could use to take your picture and it would tell you what kind of person you were according to AI. My result, <laughs> a divorced man. <laughs> I have never been married. <laughs> This turned into a kind of internet phenomenon, and uh, it sort of made the point that I was trying to make. I was very frustrated with AI models, and I wanted to imagine different kinds of models. Computer vision systems see in ways that are very literal, and I wanted to make models that, that did not see the world in literal ways. And so I started building models based on literature, poetry, philosophy. And my point was the way that we actually see images is highly allegorical. Think about something like Freud's interpretation of dreams. The meaning of an image like a window, or false teeth, or a swollen throat, for Freud, has nothing to do with architecture or oral hygiene. So to do this, I had to create my own training libraries to create my own taxonomies and build my own neural networks. And when I did this, you could build very different kinds of computer vision systems, computer vision systems that would see fantastical objects. And I think about these models themselves as kinds of artworks, the digital ways of seeing the world in radically different ways. And so I started taking my models and running them backwards. Instead of using them to see the world, I started using them to generate new kinds of images. The vampire, these are some of the images that you see below, uh, the downstairs. A man, the Tower of Babel, a pair of eyes. 
I started building other models, ones that don't classify images at all, but, in turn, but instead turn their abstractions into colors. I wanted to build models that would see the world without classifying it or without judging it. I want to leave you with a final thought. The works that I have shown you today and that are included in the exhibition ask questions about how do we see the technological infrastructures around us? How do those technological infrastructures see us? But I want to leave you with a question that I'm thinking about now, which is how do technologies and the interests behind them prompt us to see things that may or may not be there? And how do those things that may or may not be there nonetheless become real? In other words, how do technologies prompt us to hallucinate? And how do our hallucinations take on a life of their own? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Trevor. And we have all run slightly over time. So the talk will be about 30 minutes. We will keep about 10 minutes for the final Q&A. So we're going to keep to the original ending time, but uh, we're going to be shuffling around with the actual time breakdown. The last time you met was five or six years ago, before the pandemic. Am I right? So it's been five or six years since you met face to face. Compared with the previous discussion, uh, you've had five or six years pass by. There was a pandemic for three, four years. Two wars have broken out. And there have been a number of extremely important developments. I was wondering how, what were the past five or six years like for you? Hito, could you go first, please? <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, we never really exited that period, you know. I, we're still living in it. And the, the changes are quite radical and still ongoing, so it's very hard to give any sort of final pronouncements about them. Um, yeah, I'm, what have I been doing? I learned programming, and then ChatGPT came along and did it on my behalf, so I stopped <laughs> <laughs> So I stopped learning to program. Now ChatGPT does my programming. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> that's, that's the five years in a nutshell. <laughs> Programming. Programming and chat GPT. Interesting. Um, Trevor, you have stopped using AI in your work. I understand. Could you talk about some of the ways in which that happened? How did you come to stop using AI in your work? Yeah, so when... AI was being developed. A lot of the works that you see downstairs were from a moment where AI hadn't really happened yet in the way that it has now. And what I was doing was reading research papers that were coming out of academia, taking you know proposed algorithms, proposed ways of building models, and building them myself in my studio and building models from scratch, more or less. And so I really understood everything that I was doing and I, and I had enormous amount of control over what I wanted those models to be, what I wanted them to do, and could do what, could turn the technology into something that I wanted it to be. 
And I think that that moment has passed. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the scale of the models now, they're just huge, 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 much, much bigger. They're much more curated in a way, not actually on the front end, but on the back end. So in a way, I weirdly feel like it's much more limited what you can do with them now than what, it, what you were able to do with them when you had to build them yourself. Um, so that on one hand. The second part of that is I just got bored. <laughs> like chat GPT is really boring to me. <laughs> and, um, and it's not actually interesting. And um, you know, with, the, with a lot of the image generators that are out there, I, I, I want to echo, I guess, what you were saying. There is this kind of Connection. convergence on the a, a median kind of aesthetic. And what, to me, was exciting about the early days is that they were completely fucked up. <laughs> and they didn't work, and you were, they were extremely glitchy, and that you could, you could have some control over the aesthetic that you wanted, but it would also produce things that were novel and surprising, and you really did feel like you were having a, a dialogue in, in, in a way with these, these very strange model objects. Um, so, I, so I've stopped using AI in my work just because I don't think it is really the existing technologies generate things. I can't get them to generate things that I think are interesting. They're very good at making memes, but I don't think they're very good at making things that I find you know, that rise to the level of, of being interesting artworks. Now, having said that, that's not to say that I'm uninterested in AI. I'm extremely interested in AI, but I'm more thinking about how it's changing our collective psychology, how it's changing our relationship to images, how it's changing our relationship to each other, and thinking about the ways in which it is increasingly being weaponized against us, whether that's in the form of you know, the mass appropriation of the world's culture and the packaging of that together by giant companies to sell back to us, whether that is the creation of this class of uh, micro workers, or whether that is the creation of media environments that are increasingly more actively predatory in terms of uh, trying to uh, extract value from us, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the same. I mean, I also stopped almost using any sort of so-called AI-generated imagery. I only used it once recently when I had to generate something which looks really ugly. <laughs> so that worked very well. Um, but otherwise, you know, there's, uh, even if you go quite far into the technology, you do have some controls, et cetera. But you never know what the initial foundation model was being trained on, yeah. right? There could be, I don't know, child pornography or something coming at you because it's all in there. Not only presumably, but it has also been shown that it's in there. So in that sense, you work with something which you are not given the means to understand because most of it is in a black box, it's proprietary, and uh, the output is, yeah, it converges towards some kind of um, uncontroversial, optimized idea of norm. So that's not an ideal artist tool, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe in, in the generation of sound, there could be some much more interesting um, develop, uh, results, but image is uh, at the moment not a very fruitful um, area to work with, with image generators. But as Trevor said, I completely agree. I think the political economy of AI is something which is vast, it is expanding, it has extremely important consequences for our lives. It's very relevant, especially in relation to its energy consumption, its environmental output, um, the you know mining of resources, uh, burning of electricity, etc., etc. And the question is, what for, right? 
mm-hmm. to generate more shrimp Jesus memes. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you have the feeling that you know whole coal mines are being fired up to produce more cats with hats, and they look horrible. <laughs> so yeah, no, but it's really the case. So I really started also thinking about this energy yeah. aspect, and I refrained from generating. And also the interfaces are built in a way that you need to keep generating. It's mm-hmm. like a slot machine, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You, you do one image and it's not good. So you try again and you try again and you try it again and you try it again. Because you have little controls to really adjust it the way you want and, and you end up burning a lot of resources and you never really get the result you wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, I think last time we spoke, mm-hmm. We were thinking about almost like a theory of images, you know, this, this idea of invisible images, machines talking to each other. You, 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 we were thinking about the poor image, you know, a lot of, I, I wanted to ask you the question of what is an image in 2024 is what, or what is an image in relationship to technology in 2024 and would you answer that question now differently than you would have answered that you know, five or six years ago? You mentioned a few of the things in the um, Yeah, I mean, we're on, in a sort of transition, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not entirely different, but things are moving in a different direction. So for example, I mean, both you and me, we're trained, I'm a trained as a filmmaker, you're trained as a photographer. Mm-hmm. We are very much rooted in a sort of optical paradigm, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. There's a lens, there's light coming through, actual mm-hmm. photons, they have a physical impact and so on. But I think more and more, we are moving into a statistical um, mm-hmm. area, but also in a thermodynamical paradigm, mm-hmm. right? It's not you mentioned that before. What do you mean by the thermodynamic paradigm? Yeah, we are moving into an area where um, image making is no longer connected with light and optics, mm-hmm. but with statistics, power, and energy. Mm-hmm. So some of the models which are used inside the image generators are literally built on something called the heat diffusion Mm -hmm. formula, right? Mm -hmm. So basically the whole idea is to spend power and to heat things up, right? You By also power, do you mean literally like power coming out of an uh, electricity? Yeah. Okay. Electricity, mm-hmm. to, or, or any other kind of power, right? Mm-hmm. And to heat things. So that's kind of the general idea behind this kind of um, image generation. You also see it in the kind of vocabulary that CEOs use when talking about this uh, technology. They always... Um, Compare it with fire, you know, Mm -hmm. AI is fire, Mm -hmm. and we are kind of the people who bring the fire from the gods to the humans, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) And they they say that it's like fire because they think it's the most important thing than since people domesticated fire and started, you know, to heat and to cook, et cetera. So in a way, the whole um, field of thinking has shifted from light mm-hmm. to heat. And there we are also in a very interesting neighborhood because, you know, these fields are very close to, for example, finance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The heat diffusion formula is also something that's used in finance to calculate future stock option prices, etc. Mm-hmm. So basically, the more you go into the machine and into the mathematics, you end up with the idea that we completely left, in a way, the the field where vision Mm -hmm. and optics Mm -hmm. is the main thing. We're somewhere else now. And so that statistical convergence also explains this aesthetic convergence. They're the same thing. The the aesthetic convergence is like the, the visual representation of that statistical convergence. Yes, it's like you throw all data in a big pot mm-hmm. and let it stew for yeah. 20 hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the oh, no, I want to I push on that a little bit because this is reminding me of the globalization con- con- conversation in the 1990s, which was like, oh, mm-hmm. McDonald's is going to be everywhere and therefore the world will mm-hmm. all look mm-hmm. the same. And you alluded to that a little bit with, the, with your pictures of cities. But it was a little bit more complicated than that, right? Yes, because it's not 
and it's interesting, I used the image of this iPad of Apple, you know, mm -hmm. to, to illustrate this idea. Because you have the feeling that everything is being squeezed into one plane, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's flat, it looks mm -hmm. flat. Mm -hmm. But the consequence of that is that there, the whole space of a culture is being flattened into something which only knows two directions, up and down, mm -hmm. or left and right, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Because this plane is not only flat, but it also divides, right? What do you mean? Well, it, there's only, if you, if you think about this plane, mm -hmm. then there's only two positions. You can be left of that plane mm -hmm. or right of the plane. Mm -hmm. So even though it's flat, it's also polarizing. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is So basically yeah. this flatness on the other hand creates these massive polarization and conflicts because if people are only being exposed to this kind of average imagery mm -hmm. yeah. then they cannot tolerate any outliers, right? I think there's a second dynamic going on which is well which is the amplification of those outliers. Mm -hmm. So you, you do mm -hmm. have this aesthetic conver mm -hmm. convergence, mm -hmm. but I think that that convergence, the inverse of that is the amplification of difference. Here's what I mean by that. I think that in a few years time, you and I may watch a television show on Netflix and we're going to see a different version mm -hmm. of that show yep. because that show will yeah, be yeah. you you have Absolutely. a metadata profile that's different yeah, yeah, than yeah. mine it will be custom generated it'll be custom generated yeah. for you right and what will be added mm -hmm. into that show are things that you see or hear that will be designed to sell you something mm -hmm. or try to extract some kind of value from you or induce some kind of activity in you. So on, on one hand, you do have this convergence, but at the same time, you have the opportunity, uh, a media landscape that is primed to increasingly create your own world for you. Yes, right. within certain parameters. Within the parameters of yes. like the economic parameters of trying to extract yeah, yeah. some kind of value from I, you. I don't think there is any sort of um, contradiction there. Yeah. I even think that you know you can have different data worlds, which in fact already exist today, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There are completely there are data silos which are completely shut off from mm -hmm. one another, and so you cannot even access this other data exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that averaging, that, that that convergence, would you say that it's not it's, it's more of a political economy slash aesthetic convergence? To to me, it seems it's it's not just an aesthetic convergence. It's an aesthetic mm -hmm. convergence that is motivated by an underlying economic relationship that of you're course. going to have to images. Yes. The, the aesthetic is just the outcome, right? Yeah. It's just the consequence mm -hmm. of these big data silos mm -hmm. in which data do not longer circulate, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere else, mm -hmm. but just remain put for extraction mm -hmm. and for creating all these variations of the same. Mm -hmm. Because what you're describing, these custom-made TV shows, yeah. etc., are basically variations of something that is essentially not changing. Yeah. Yeah. I always I was recently thinking about the quote, I forgot who made it, but it was a famous advertising executive who said, fifty percent of advertising doesn't work. The problem is we don't know which fifty percent doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. But with these newer kind of tools yeah. that that can get much more amplified. You can know that ninety nine percent of it works, for example. Yeah. The consequence of that is that as you have a media environment that is much more efficient economically, you radically reduce the space of weird stuff happening or that you radically reduce the space yep. of the possibility for radical culture, I guess, yeah, for lack of a... Yeah, but this is the flattening, yeah. I guess, you know? I also made notes when you spoke and you mentioned changes to time, right? Mm -hmm. What yeah. kind of time space are we living in? And the interesting thing is that I think 
there, there is this strange kind of tension also in relation to the creation of time because each second there's years of footage being uploaded to YouTube. Yeah. So the present is multiplied a lot. I calculated that, you know, if one, some, one person wanted to watch one year on, of uploads to YouTube, it takes 30 years. <laughs> and if you watch YouTube for 33 years, then you will already span almost, you know, the entire living history. So in a way, time is slowed down a lot mm -hmm. inside these silos. Mm -hmm. But because it's so inert in there, it creates a lot of tension elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you? Do you, you look like you want to interrupt us? Maybe we, we were afraid that we go off into a direction that only interests us, but no one else will be able to follow. So please interrupt us because we can go on for, until tomorrow morning. There's many questions here. I, mean, mm -hmm. you, I think there is one question about looking at images and what what does it mean to read an image now? Which I think has radically changed, actually. Mm -hmm. um, there's other things we can talk about. We can talk about this neurological aspect of images and things as well. But if we just talk about the practice of looking at images now, one of, I've noticed a lot of things. One thing that I've noticed is that there's whole aesthetic histories that have been rewritten for me now in the sense, like if I look at like synth pop images from like the 80s, or if I look at sci-fi like 1970s illustrations, I read those now as AI generated images, right? <laughs> I just, I look at, I'm like, oh, that looks like an That's AI cool. thing now. And what, what a kind of a tragedy that mm -hmm. is really, mm -hmm. right? Because it is this overriding yeah. of, of huge histories that I actually think are quite interesting. So we have that on one hand. We have, an, on the other hand, this question of what's real versus not real. Like when you're reading the internet now, I very regularly am reading some articles. Like, I don't know if this is an AI thing or a human thing. Is that interesting to notice or not? That, that's another thing to think about as well. Is, is there a, we were, we always kind of knew intellectually that we should not trust language or that we should not trust image, but that, 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 that feels different now in the age of AI. Yeah, I think the distrust is much more global now. I mean, I, I realize I barely look at images anymore, mm -hmm. especially news images. I yeah. mean, it's like, why should I even spend time looking at them? You know, mm -hmm. they more or less lost the evidence value Mm -hmm. um, so that's a huge, huge shift because I used to try to look at images very closely and at the details and so on. And uh, right now I'm like, why bother? Mm -hmm. Why bother at all? Mm -hmm. mm. On this cultural flattening, so you were talking about a world in which AI models have kind of eaten all of culture and ingested mm -hmm. the history of images in order to create new ones that are essentially regurgitations of things from the, the training set, pushing that forward and that leading to a kind of standstill in visual culture where it's sort of visual culture ends in 2024 or what have you and everything. <laughs> But hear me out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is this feel different than the Warhol moment, for lack of a better word? You know, I think mm -hmm. about the Warhol mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, I and, think yeah. I, have, I really have an answer because I compare it to something maybe unexpected, uh, which is something from Marx, actually, mm -hmm. who called this the metabolic rift. What yeah. is the mm -hmm. metabolic rift? And I think we have something comparable now, a digital rift. So what is the metabolic rift? It's the moment when a sort of circulation within human economy stops. So what is this circulation? Um, um, yeah, 
the produce from the fields used to be taken to the city mm -hmm. from the countryside. Then some people ate it. Then they shed it out. And mm -hmm. the um, excrements were taken back to the fields mm -hmm. as fertilizer. So there was a circle. And Marx said this circle was interrupted at that moment when basically the waste was not taken back to the fields anymore. And then it started accumulating in the cities mm -hmm. in form of you know, untreated wastewater. There was epidemics, there was cholera, there was something called the Great Stink mm -hmm. in London, right, where the Thames was so polluted that people who fell in died immediately, mm -hmm. right? So it created this huge crisis, which could only be solved after there was large infrastructural public works to establish uh, sewage, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I think in a way we're in a similar situation now with data, mm -hmm. where data do not really circulate anymore, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because they are being kept in proprietary silos mm -hmm. and they accumulate in there and stagnate. Mm -hmm. I, I, one could call it stinky data. Because, yeah, <laughs> Somebody called it Habsburg data, like it becomes increasingly inbred to the point yeah, where exactly, it's... Exactly, Habsburg <laughs> data. <laughs> yeah. So you have a sort of equivalent of a sanitation crisis, mm -hmm. right? Because these data accumulate, they stagnate, they don't smell so well, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And you would need, at this point, a huge effort, you mm -hmm. know, investing into infrastructure uh, to create some sort of circulation or metabolism again, mm -hmm. where data from one area could fertilize, you know, ideas mm -hmm. in another area. But I do not see who is going to do this. Well, right and now. you're seeing this in the, a lot of the technology trade press where they're complaining about running out of data, right? To yeah. build bigger models, you need more data at this point if you've ingested the whole internet and you've ingested every book that's ever been written, where is that supposed to come from, right? On one hand, and then the problem of compute, and you mentioned this metabolic rift as, as being, having an ecological component mm -hmm. to it Absolutely. as well. And, yeah. you, and do you know when you're looking at uh, the amount of compute that's required to make the newer models, it's incredible. It's just, un it literally is, as you described before, you know, setting the world on fire in order to uh, yeah, for what? Make, <laughs> to, to cats make, with uh, hats. <laughs> yes. To make cats with hats. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs>